Thank you. Hi, I'm Kelly Hoey, and I am one of the co-founders of Women Innovate Mobile. We are a New York City-based startup accelerator, and we started doing this series with Apple back in January, and it's great to be here in Chicago. One of the other things that I did this year, which was really exciting, was participate in a flight that British Airways put on. Um, just a small little idea they had, you know, can we, you know, put a bunch of people on a plane and change the world? Like, what happens when you put a bunch of big thinkers on a flight from San Francisco to London and ask them to hack the problem of the global misalignment of tech talent? So on that flight, this unprecedented gathering of, I don't know, there was activists and politicians and community and startup founders and CEOs and all sorts of things. On this flight with two people sitting next to me, um, we all met on that infamous flight. And um, Peter, read your bio, yeah. self-described medical device rep re in rehab, but tell everybody about you. Hi there, I'm Peter Sheehan. Um, I started a company out of Chicago here solving a problem with managing uh, vendor reps coming and going within hospitals without permission because I was a rep breaking the rules. So I figured it's like a, it's like a bank. Solve your whole problem. A bank hiring the, the thief to be head of security, so to speak. Uh, I sold that company. And um, how I got involved with Ungrounded is I was tooling around on the internet, got to Mashable.com. And they asked, where were you when you came up with your best idea? And I told them about the company I started. Next thing you know, I was in San Francisco uh, with all of you and a lot of very smart people. And that was, it was quite a trip. Well, we're, we're going to talk about that because there was actually a lot of people who were asked to go who hesitated. And I wouldn't know about that. But anyway, so Laura, you're on a mission with education in Haiti. You, you are, and you believe in the power of the uh, for-profit companies to make world change. But tell everybody about you. Hi, I'm Laura Hartman. I'm actually from Chicago originally, and I'm a professor of business ethics, leadership, and strategy at DePaul University here in our hometown. I um, worked for three years um, at Zynga, and Zynga is an online social game company. And you might not know the Zynga name, you might, but otherwise, um, they created Words with Friends and Farmville. Do how many of you all know those games? Okay, most. Well, I mean, we're at Apple. Okay, but it, it, it's, they're great and they're very fun, but I worked at Zynga.org and they um, contribute players' funds to charitable causes. And I ran the um, division of Zynga.org that got to choose the charitable cause and then also went out and did due diligence to make sure your money went to those causes. So it was, at the time, relatively um, uh, innovative and unique. It was the first to ever do that, and I was very proud of the work. We've now raised over $15 million for charitable organizations throughout the world for emergency relief and other um, really great reasons. So there I think was a that reason, was one. There was reason by daikon radishes there, on, on farm, farm And bill. Sweet Seeds for Haiti was yeah. one of the first. Uh, so see, I paid attention I think to these that's things. why I might have been. It might, might have been why you were asked. Invited. So the big problem that British Airways was asking us to solve was the global misalignment of talent. But this was a competition. There was four teams. There was, let me read this off. There was fostering women in STEM. Uh, there was growing STEM and emerging economies. Uh, there was expanding STEM, uh, like how can we get other disciplines given that the percentage of uh, students in STEM graduating from college is extraordinarily low. And then um, meeting the U.S. demand um, for, for STEM talent. Explain what STEM is. Oh, in case anyone, STEM, just anyone know what STEM is? Science, technology, engineering, and math. If you feel bad about that, I would say Minimum 50% of the plane didn't know what STEM was. and We still we, went on the flight. We still went on the flight, so don't yeah, feel bad about so, that. So, so all of that kind of good stuff. So you guys were on the growing STEM in emerging economies. So did you have some like thoughts beforehand on I, what the answer would be? or? I think a recurring theme that I learned was that we keep on thinking about how can we go build something for cheap over there to come bring it and sell it here. And really, it, it quickly became... The answer was, how do we build something over there and sell it over there? And that's how we can really make some change. And when, when I first couple times I heard that, and it just proliferated. I would agree. That was a, a constant theme that we discussed. I think as well that um, most people think that when you think of emerging economies, it's just, it's 
cheap labor and let's just get it built and, and bring it back and sell it and it's inexpensive. I think what we don't always think of that came out of the conversation that I was really glad came out was the concept that there's so many resources in emerging economies that we don't think about and that we really need to bring those resources to the table and match them with resources that we have in some of the developed countries and figure out a better way to match those two groups of resources towards a better synergy for everyone, not just let's get them over here to the United States. That wasn't really the conversation. It was a better match. I'll also say that I felt here I am, a clearly a, a white woman living in Chicago, and I was going to be a voice on that plane representing, I guess, or, or talking about emerging economies. And I felt a significant responsibility to represent a variety of voices. So before I went on the plane, I contacted a number of my colleagues in Haiti, because I have quite a few there, but also in other countries in the world, um, and talked to them about what ideas they wanted to make sure were represented. So I felt a burden, a, an important burden, to make sure that other voices were heard on the plane other than these 100 innovator, innovators, or at least other than my own voice, and I wanted to make sure that those were there, so I had notes from them. This is a good segue to talk about what happened before the plane, because Peter was yelling at me upstairs. People might have heard it. So there was four there's four themes, and within this flight, there was teams, so we were between each other we were competing, and within each subject area we were competing. So this was, I mean, they put, intentionally, this was a competition. So my team, I know you're still mad at me about this. Yeah, they'll understand, they'll side with me. But they're not, they, you know, you have to talk in your mic. They will side with me, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's important to say that in the mic. <laughs> say that in the microphone if you want that on the podcast. So my team, got together via Twitter oh, the night before. People got upset at this. Yeah, people got upset at this. And we said this was a competition, so let's start brainstorming the idea now. Um, and I just, anyone, if you're going to be on a hackathon that you, you need to have a team, make sure you've got a college student who knows how to stay up all night and code, because that's really, really key. So our team came up with an idea, and right before we got on the plane, we launched a website. And the reason yeah. we did that wait, was did you no hear the word? Yeah. Wait, 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 did you hear the word? Right before we got on the yeah. plane. And I had a post-it note I was pretty proud of. <laughs> and it's I didn't know anyone on my yeah. team beforehand. Okay, so the whole thing is that you get on this plane, and I know they don't want to hear about all this. They want to know, like, the cool plane and the seats, right? Look, they want to know about the food. I mean, we'll get to this, so we got to skip the content. Okay, but let's skip the key <laughs> important parts out. So the, what she's not telling you is that the four teams, and we're only representing two here, so picture two other teams, you had to compete among the team, and the way you compete is with, like, post-its, and you walk around the plane and you vote with post-its, and we'll get to details if you want. And so you walk around the plane, you vote, and then only one idea per team is going to get off the plane. So at the end of the flight, when you're exhausted and everything, only one idea is getting off the plane per four of these four groups, and you're going to the UN's G8, and you're going to present it. So, like, it's a big win. In terms of people who were on your team, right, overall, all right, you had Penny from um, the uh, Clinton Global Initiative, right? You had the CEO of Rocket Space. You had Nicholas from NASA. I mean, he yeah, put his stuff into space. I mean, this was crazy. He was smart. Yeah, but let's just thank God um, he was. He was yeah. doing a job he's got. Um, and, you know, you have Craig from Craigslist. I mean, you had some ridiculous... I mean, this was the whole thing. I mean, you had people who are keynotes and CEOs, and how are they going to get all us, us all to behave? So was there anything that was, like, surprising in that in terms of organizing and orchestrating all those type A's? Yeah, I think that... We had everyone there was a leader, everyone. And we, we all led, we did, and everyone was a type A. And speaking for myself as a professor, I sort of wanted to stand up and tell everyone what to do. And I think that, you know, as CEOs, as people who run their own businesses, everyone wanted to run this business. And everyone wanted their idea to come off the plane. And so it was pretty tough. And yet, it was organized in such a way that your voices got to be heard. And if someone was a bit of a, you know, too big a voice, 
our confidence levels were strong enough that we could just ignore them and move on. And so people learned how to engage in that right. environment. They also, my understanding is that the flight crew was handpicked. They could apply. And they were handpicked to be able to deal with these types of personalities. Well, they don't want to buckle their seatbelts. They don't want to put their seatbacks up. And so the, these flight crew people, they would just like, we were sitting in the aisles and they just would stand over us. And they were fabulous. And so they were handpicked to be able to deal with us, us types. Exactly. So this was a regular plane. This was not like a retrofitted plane to be a, you know, a hackathon. This was a regular plane. So of course there was a selection of who got to sit in which sections of the plane. We all got the same service, no issues there. But we had to meet together as teams and write, like all of a sudden think about it, that little tray that you pull down. That is your writing surface now, right? What you're saying is this is a very weird environment to be working in. Right. I mean, someone asked before we got on here, was it, what made it work? And I said, it was a very open-ended question in a very confined space. Which, which, which gets to that kind of like, what are the takeaways of this? It's sort of this, you know, how do you foster creativity in a constrained, you know, under constraints? And we had constraints of time, and we had constraints of space. The innovation that can happen when you're up thousands of miles in the sky and you can't get out, there's a certain type of innovation that happens there. And then, of course, there are challenges. So you're within this space, and you have a certain amount of time, and you're under time pressure. And so you can imagine the type of innovation that's going to occur. And yet, you also don't have the time for the thought process. You can't do additional research. There's no Wi-Fi in the sky. It drives me crazy. That, I mean, when you're going overseas. And so we can't get the additional knowledge we might need to get. So right. there's some pluses and then there's some challenges that we might do under different in a different environment. Is there anything from that environment you've taken away? Um, there is. I believe, well, first of all, the most wonderful thing that I would say I've taken away are the relationships. And you can imagine, you know, you're with someone or a group of people for a few hours. And so the relationships that we built, you wouldn't have built under other business environments and you had an experience that you otherwise wouldn't have had where you got to know people in a business setting, but working on, um, on a project that was really exciting. I mean, I think your question is, where would I take this? If I was running a large company, yep. do I go charter a jet? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but do I put, put people out of their environment and, and mix them with people they don't normally work with and ask them very broad questions? Yeah, I would certainly think this is applicable if you're running a, a company that is making its cash this way, but you know you have to innovate. This is a model that uh, a large company should be putting in place immediately. I mean, it was just like the crazy things we had to think about. Like, how do you display your ideas on one of those big sticky post-it notes, but the only place you can hang it is on, you know, the overhead storage? And, and by the way, people have to walk by and look at this. And you have to, pi you have to pitch it. So why don't you explain the process of how we... So, so what happened was after we wined and dined and socialized, then we had to get down to work. And um, we got with our teams. You had to map out what your, your solution was to your various problems, um, put it on these big post-it notes, and then people had to come around and vote on it. So think about the constraints of, of a plane in a plane aisle where they're telling you not to, you know, don't gather in the, you know, don't stand in front of the bathrooms, don't do this, don't do that thing, all the announcements on a plane. Well, we did all of that. We did, we did all of that and then some. And you had to pitch it. So you had to think about how am I displaying this information when someone may be looking at it from two inches away and how am I going to explain it to them when they're feeling, you know, confined and it's hot and I've got 60 other ideas to look at and move along, move along, move along. Um, there was a lot of bartering for votes as well. It's like, give true. me one, I'll give you one. But, and you had but to there were some ideas that absolutely shined. Yes. And you were like, how did, how did, I mean, yours was really good. I mean, well, and all which, kidding which, aside. Which, which, they had two days the, to do the, it. You know, the advantage you had. But there, <laughs> there, was, uh, there was a lot of great ideas. I, help me with the name, the backpack one. Um, beacon, beacons in a backpack. So he's, someone came up with the idea that if someone was backpacking in a remote part of the world, put a solar panel on the backpack and a Wi-Fi signal and bring Wi-Fi. I mean, it's a good way to make friends in a village in Africa if you're you know, walking around with Wi-Fi on your back. And it was those crazy ideas where nobody was sitting there and asking whether or not it was really feasible. They just let you run with it. And now, 
from what I've been they watching, are. they're funded and they're, they're doing it. They're building it today. So, Which, What was your favorite idea? Other than your own and mine, of course. <laughs> I like that one. And I also like, and I, I don't remember the names, but so every, every package of food has its ingredients. In so it. That, it's, that was my favorite. Yeah. In, in it. Is so one. in it. Yeah, the branding was awesome. And the idea of if, if I'm a, someone from an emerging economy and I want to be able to code for Facebook or Google or Apple someday, I better learn these languages. So every technology has a, its nutritional value of what made up that actual technology. And what, what, what would happen? Because even in Chicago, you think about the developer that, you know, something gets hot and all the developers run to that. And so right. if you can get the world building what's a hot code, that would be really good. Right. So, so, so think about, you know, buying your iPad and there's a code on it that you then scan and look at and it tells you what's in it. Like, what is the technology in this? You know, um, how was this built? What's behind it? And who built it? Right? So that you could be inspired. So you think about that makes sense with the technology, but you think about, all right, how can we inspire girls or someone else to get into technology? What happens if you had that kind of technology code on a lipstick, right? You think about the companies, the science, you know, the, the engineering that is behind the everyday products we use. Uh, that one was my favorite. It was brilliant. I like Advise Her. So Advise Her, which I then afterwards really was happy to support, and I love it, is, um, came out of the project to inspire or to think about how to inspire more girls and women, girls, to get involved in STEM because it's really a challenge. When you think about the STEM issues, you think about boys, and you think about boys in their, you know, clubs, math clubs, or whatever in school, and you don't necessarily think about that being populated by girls. And girls might even start, but then they get discouraged as they get older, and they get into, you know, it's why we have girls in HR and boys are in tech. And, and that's, the numbers prove it out. We want to really encourage girls and women to either get into or stay in STEM. And so Advisor is a program that would encourage women in STEM to act as mentors and advisors to work with one-on-one -on -one younger girls and then young women to act as mentors to them um, as they're going through school and then going through their young professional life. But to get both, you know, the woman on the street and the woman in the boardroom and get the highest place women in our country, you know, and get them to sign on as well. And, you know, I actually um, had talked with a woman at, um, at Dell and then talked to a woman at Intel who I know and they, the woman at Intel would really love to get Intel, the entire Intel, to get women at Intel to work with advisors. So I connected them. So Awesome. Let's talk about this in terms, because I sort of think, you know, the relationships and some of this other stuff, but what are some of these other takeaways other than the fact that we had this crazy, fabulous flight and we want to know when we can do it again and sign me up and all the rest of it. But one of the other things I was thinking about was the brainstorming, like, yeah. you know, kind of ideas on how, you know, did anything on your thinking on, on brainstorming and coming up with ideas, did any of that change as a result of this flight? Yeah, I think that, you know, Peter suggested, well, you know, if I had a company and I could get a jet and I could take 100 people who didn't know each other, you know, that's great. But, you know, I can't do that. And I don't know how many of you out there, maybe you're getting ideas and you have a jet and you can do this. And that would be great and I highly recommend it. But I can't do that. So for us, um, and I don't mean us to Paul, but for us at the School of Choice, we really, I wanted to take something away from this. And we, the school is very progressive. Um, it's, it has no money. And yet it really wants to be a very strong, progressive leadership development school for children who are living in poverty in Haiti, right? But I wanted to take something back from this flight and say, how could we use lessons from this flight to be more innovative and more creative at this school both with the students and with the teachers. And so what we wanted to do was think, how do we recreate this? So I went back and actually over the summer, we needed to figure out how we were going to integrate more leadership in the program. So I sat down and I had papers and we had all our faculty and staff and I had these big you know, white posters. And I said, okay, I want you all to think if we had all the money in the world, what ideas would you want about our leadership program and what would you do differently at assembly or with our athletics and all. And I just wanted to open their mind. And I know this isn't really a new innovation and creativity, but I got the white papers and I got the little dots that we used and I got them to vote and I got them to have ideas. And I just sort of replicated what we did on the plane and I did it with them. 
and just having a new process was helpful. And I just told them, if you had all the money, the UN was funding you. It was just a fun adventure for them to think about it. And it was just something they had never done before. So I think just bringing new processes to groups that you've worked with forever and giving them a new way to vote, a new way to think, giving them new inspiration with no boundaries. There were ideas that they came up with that then you put the boundaries on afterwards and you can still figure it out, but they have to spread their wings first. I would say the two takeaways is one, I need to participate in more contests online because <laughs> I'm one for one, so I should keep that going. Just and two, is the concept that IDEO drilled into us is what if we, you know, what if we did this? What if we did that? And, the, you know, everyone's brainstormed and we, we know the conventions, but the way IDEO did it really and, and wrangled in a lot of very smart type A leaders. I thought they did a great job, and you know, I think this is something you can absolutely repeat. So, We don't have to have like trays and tiny trays and a, someone coming down with a trolley. The next and, one will be a big bus. <laughs> no. And there are some things, <laughs> Kelly, there are some things I wouldn't do. Right. I mean, I think that, I mean, yeah, whether it's yeah. not having trays, but there are some, I mean, BAE was great, British Airways, I want to applaud their creativity, and you have to take risks. You've got to try some things. But I think that majority vote has problems and that majority vote is not always the best way to a right answer. I did admit that I teach ethics and <laughs> you can all remember times in our nation's history, times in the world's history where the majority got things wrong, right? And so majority, I would suggest, might not have been the right way on our flight and in the future, I would suggest that might not be the right way to get these projects approved. Right. In terms of the projects, I, I agree. I, I completely agree. Do we need to, to sort of set big, massive challenges to affect change? I, I think so, because of what look we're talking about it today. Right. So it's not just what happened in those 10 hours on the flight and a couple of days hanging out with the Baroness of Scotland. <laughs> she was really cool. Um, we did. We hung yeah, out with the Baroness of Scotland and the House person. of Lords. Yeah. Yeah, we were hanging out at the House of Lords. So, but we're here today talking about it, and then this podcast will live on. So do we need to do big, big, big ideas? Absolutely, because they just keep continuing on, especially in the world where we can con continue to deliver this content for others to hear about it. I, I think we must, because an ability creates responsibility. If we do not, then we're just overwhelmed. I mean, when we talk about STEM, when we talk about the water crisis, when we talk about poverty, it's as if we're looking at it and we think, oh my gosh, it's too big. How will we ever you know, alleviate poverty in the world? That's this bird's eye view, right? And you look down and you think, oh, it's too much. Well, you're right, then it'll never, ever go away. But if you get down on the ground, and I guess this is the wrong metaphor for our flight, because we were up above, <laughs> but if you get down on the ground and what Muhammad Yunus would call the worm's eye view, and, and you get to know people, and you look at their faces, and you know their names, and you understand that this individual doesn't have water, or is living in poverty, or has no access to the internet. Then you figure out, okay, I can help this person, and then that person, then that person, then that person. And then, in time, many people are helped. And we, on that plane, are privileged. We're privileged. And we had the opportunity, the knowledge, the skills, the capacity, to then answer those challenges, and now we're moving forward and we're doing it. And I think that all three of us, since that flight, have taken steps and moving, moved forward. How necessary was the competition part of it? I think it was vital considering what we keep talking Other about. Other than Mashable. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, the amount of people that were on there, I think it, it kept people focused. And I thought that, I thought that the, to be able to say that, you know, your idea was gonna be presented to the UN, yeah. some serious bragging rights, so the stakes were high. And I, I do remember what happened is people pitched their ideas, and then you can go up and you can sign your name next to whatever idea you wanted to go with. And I had my name on Beacon and a backpack, and last second I changed it. It's the lesson learned of always is to trust your gut. <laughs> because they, I mean, they're doing great. They're funded, they were able to meet a lot of really nice people on the, uh, once they were over in London. So, I mean, the competition, is, it was, it, there was a lot of trash talking on the plane, needless to say, so it was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's on our B reel on, the, on on this podcast. But and how do you take the comp? Where do you take it in terms of the the notion that if competition is then necessary, where do you take it? Like for, take your example with, with what you did with your brainstorming. 
you know, you took you incorporated the, the the voting in terms of all right. Yeah, but not be. I mean, I would say competition wasn't necessary. I'm someone who really much more believes in the content. I think that that people would have come up with them. I was about to say to Peter, Peter, if the idea is valuable, what does it matter whose name was on it? And the idea should be out in the world. But we're all different types of people. I would have been really excited if you know four ideas from emerging economy that came out and nothing else, who knows? I mean, we all have our passions about what's really important in the world. So what's really important wasn't necessarily that my name was on piece of paper, it was that I really care more about emerging economies than I do about like one of the other issues. Well, what well, was interesting when we first got notices, it was all all the the issue was the global misalignment of, of tech talent. Right. And that was all it was. And then all of a sudden it was defined into four problems. So whether or not if they just stuck us to brainstorm, we would have come up with, well, here are the problems. Score, right? Would have been four problems? Would have been two? Would have been 20? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think if you didn't put any structure to it, we would have had a difficulty. And quite frankly, nothing prohibits anybody from taking any of those ideas and actually moving forward with them. Just because Advisor and Beacon in a Backpack technically M money, won. Money, money, money. Well, there's be opportunities if you had the passion and the drive to take it forward, we could raise some money. I mean, let's put a collection out here tonight. Maybe we could get a few bucks. Please fund Peter's project. No, not mine. He's so I actually good. Wouldn't have, I wouldn't have funded my project. Put his name on it. I wouldn't have funded my project. I really wouldn't. I would have done it in it, though, for sure. Oh, yeah, for I think, And I think companies, if they got pitched that, would throw money at that in a heartbeat. Oh, it was, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. What's the technology that's in it? All right, since we have already have talked about STEM... Science, technology, education, uh, engineering. engineering, and math. Should there be an A in there for art that has come up? STEAM, right? Yep. Well, should, we, there, should it be that's STEM? One of the projects. Should, should we be, should be STEAM rather than STEM? Well, speaking as someone who does believe that arts and athletics are really valuable for a complete leader, I think it's really important because art. Learning about art um, spurs your creativity and innovation. So I think that a form of art is really important. I think it's the way you approach it, though, that's valuable. And so when you teach people about the arts, I don't care what arts it is. I think it's the process of learning about art that creates a, a form of imagination and creative, imaginative, imaginative, um, innovative processing that helps us to be better community members, so I think it's important. I think that what we did on the plane was art. I mean, to, to take nothing For and turn it into something in 10 hours, I mean, what does a sculpture do? What does a dancer do? It takes something in their head and they put it out there. So as far as I'm concerned, that was a lot of art going on already, so maybe the A's already there. Absolutely. You don't want, I think that even ideas that you, you put aside, you really need to go back to them and consider them. I think that for many of us, when you're considering um, your gut, and you said, well, your gut doesn't lie, I think your gut sometimes isn't really exercised very well. And your gut might say, oh, this is a bad idea. You need someone next to you to say, wait, Laura, don't dismiss that. That might be a really great idea if you only looked at it from another perspective. And you need people to challenge you, to give you doubt, because your gut sometimes is really dumb. And you might just not like that because it used the wrong phrase or the wrong word. And if they phrased it a little differently, you'd say, oh my gosh, of course. That's a really great plan. I just wasn't thinking of it in that light. You need people to challenge you. And I really welcome those challengers because it makes me stop and think. I happen to think that most ideas that do get green lighted by the time they actually get out to the universe, there's a lot of pi pivots that take place and it doesn't even resemble. So it'll be interesting to see what is Beacon in a backpack when it's actually out in the universe versus what we saw on the airplane? And that's the beauty of it. It doesn't have to stay the same. But we will all have a kind of a special place in our heart for it and wish it the best as it goes out there. All right, so I'm going to... My last question is going to be the question that BA put out there in the first place. Can a transatlantic flight save the world? It can be a step in the process. I think one flight doesn't do it, but I think that all of us coming together can be a part, because I think that every one of us and the people sitting here tonight, you all can be change agents, and we all should feel the ability to change the world. So it can be a process. And I'm sure there's some people who, in the audience who've got questions. What, what, what takeaways would you take, Laura, Peter, and Kelly, uh, from, this, from this experience and provide to people that are trying to innovate in their own companies? You started talking about 
some of the lessons that each of you did, and you've already applied some of these things. Is this a, an applicable strategy for sparking innovation in teams that, uh, that aren't used to doing it? I think that um, the only thing that I would add, James, is that Peter was saying, you know, I want to be part of an organization that innovates or that has innovation as part of its culture and environment. And I think that some organizations say that that's what they do. And you get there and, and it's just lip service. And they say, we're innovative, we do that. And they're innovative because like, they allow flex time or that they think that their culture is innovative somehow. But what does innovation really mean to you? What does that look like? And what it means to you might not be the same thing that it means to me. And so if that's something that, that is in, inspiring to you and that's important to you, you need to decide what it means to you in your job, in your industry. Because innovation in education looks very different than innovation in, a, a, I don't know what, in your industry, you know, in, in carpet making. And, and there are other things where it really is the same. So I think innovation is, is really sort of different in terms of the subject matter that we're talking about. On the other hand, innovation means something specific in terms of reforming and, and rejuvenating. And um, I think that we're all looking for that every day in our own lives to some extent, um, unless you're someone who really needs the safety and security of consistency, which is okay too. I need that every so often. So, um, you know, well, you need to think about that. You and, I, and, I also, and I, you know, I also think about the idea of, you know, the excuse, well, we can't do that because we don't have the resources. And I think, you know, we, there we were, and I mean, you joke about it. I mean, you were on a beautiful British Airways flight. You're on this gorgeous plane. Um, you're getting failed, you know, great food. But we were in, con it was constrained. We were constrained by time. We were constrained in the resources we could use. We were constrained on who we could pick to work with. We were constrained by the topics. And I think, so the idea that, oh, we can't, you know, that kind of we can't, it's like, I think that the big takeaway for companies is just remove that artificial constraint and say, you know, what if, or how could we, and take that away and then, you know, I want to say innovate within that and, and come up with ideas and then say, right, how do we implement that given what we have here? Um, so there's a question right question there in the middle. middle. Excellent. Uh, hello. So thanks for doing this. In the spirit of co-creation, uh, did you have participants from the emerging markets? And uh, what would it be like if you did in the, say, young girls, uh, say, language translation and things like that aside? You know, that was, that's such a great question. And I, they wouldn't disclose until maybe two or three days beforehand who was on the trip. And for some reason, I really, really wanted to know, not because I wanted to know, you know, was Craig Newmark coming, or was Kelly Hoey coming? I, 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 I wanted to know if you were there, but no, I, I wanted to know if these other voices was that were there. It was really important to me um, because I get concerned when these diverse voices aren't going to be there, and not because you have to have a woman, you have to have a person of color, you have to have a person of various religions. I wanted to know that the voices of stakeholders would be represented. The voices of the people who would be impacted by our decisions would be there. And so that was why very early on, I really wanted to make sure if they're, if they're not gonna tell me they're gonna be there, I'm gonna try and get them there myself. And so I was talking to these people. And the answer to your question is that I don't really believe they were there. I think it was more they were there through people like me, through Penny, through others, through these people who were representing voices. And I would say, not in their defense, but by way of explanation and by way of other projects that I'm on now um, or working toward with the UN and with others, um, as someone who now is creating some other experiences like this, um, when you really have to think about bringing those voices, there is a capacity issue and a knowledge base to bringing some voices and the representation of those voices might be more effective. And they might have a louder voice through representation rather than through those actual individuals. Now that's not always the case, and bringing a young, educated girl from Haiti might be better than bringing me to represent her voice, and I don't doubt that. 
but other, certain other populations might be better represented by someone who will strongly advocate on their behalf rather than someone who's unable to advocate for themselves. I did hear when they asked us what would you do differently, there was talk if, do, if you do this again, don't make San Francisco the launching point, you know, Zimbabwe or something different. So I think, you know, you got to crawl before you walk, walk before you run. I mean, I'm, I had the benefit of, you know, having two people on my team who um, represented, you know, the audience that we were out there to, to advocate for. And one is a young woman, um, Cassidy Williams, who was at um, Iowa State. She's a computer science grad. Um, she's one of four women left in her senior year. She started off at 20, there was 25 of them. So there's an 80% hemorrhage of women even college going into STEM. So to sit there and say to her, hey, you know, what can we do for you? And then another woman on, on my team, uh, Dr. Sue Black, who actually traveled from the UK to participate in this. So she went from the UK to San Francisco, back to the UK. Anyway, figured that one out. Um, she is, you know, scientist, uh, you know, computer scientist in, in academia. And again, you have this massive departure of women um, in computer science, even out of academic institutions um, who, are, who are there with PhDs, and what do you do about that? So we had actually two stakeholders on our team, and that you know assisted greatly. Actually, the interesting thing about Dr. Sue Black is that she runs something called Tech Mums, and it's a program to try and get mothers, but other women of middle age, she would probably say, um, to get them much more comfortable with tech. And they come in and they teach them how to use computers and how to use mouse, how to, and just how to get online. And they teach them and then they have them teach other mothers so that they're much more comfortable being taught rather than by someone who's really a tech whiz. And it's really a marvelous program and you should check it out. It's Tech Mums. And um, it's just extraordinary. And to hear these, these women talk about how it's really just made them feel so much more a part of society even because it, they feel so left out. It's, it's really doing a little bit what Advisor is doing. It's bringing them into the STEM world. Well, and, and teaching those mums how to code because the idea if you get the mums comfortable with technology and coding, they're gonna get the kids to do it and the chain mo moves that way. Other questions? That was a great question. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. This has been a great discussion. Um, as a patent attorney, the first thing I think about when I hear about 100 people on a plane talking about tech ideas is how in the world do these people present their ideas in a free-flowing manner without worrying about this person sitting next to me is going to steal this idea and all the intellectual property concerns oh. that go around that. So. For starters, did you feel that that was an impediment? Did you get the sense people were holding back? If so, how did you all overcome that? If not, is there anything that you can point to that allowed people to feel like they could have the free flow of ideas and not worry about, is my neighbor going to steal this and you know launch a product in three weeks that was actually my idea? I was just thinking, I imagine if you were invited to this actual trip, you would have, been, you would have had a lot of business cards going on and be like, hey, I can, I can protect this for you. Um, I would say no. I mean, the causes that we were, we were trying to achieve, what we were trying to accomplish, were bigger than anybody's financial ambitions. So in this instance, there, it was more of a social you know, cause than it was any financial gain. So, but of course, we got the contrarian against of what I'm saying here. Should I say beacon one more time? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Peter. Um, I don't think anybody's worried about ideas being stolen. At least I didn't you know get what? that wrong. I, don't know. I, look, I, I look at it as almost like a, it's almost like a culture change the difference that you get from being in the startup space and playing there versus being in mature companies. Um, and I think in the startup space, we're just much more about exchanging ideas and putting ideas out there because at that stage, you don't know what's going to work and all you have is your reputation. So if you get a reputation for being someone who steals everybody else's ideas, guess what? You're going to be that person in the middle seat in the back row next to the bathroom and no one's talking to you, so. You know. Yeah, I wasn't actually disagreeing. I was feeling that maybe the difference is that you have all these people on the flight who are like already CEOs and running companies and all, and if they're tossing out, I mean, I remember, I'm trying to think, we were sitting, sitting on the floor in the middle of a row, and I just remember someone saying, well, I've been thinking about this one idea for a while, let me toss it in there. And, it's like contributing something that you've been thinking about for a while and you're not gonna go with it, so toss it into the group. And 
people just didn't have a lot of ownership of it and they just didn't mind. They were happy to give it up to the group. So it was more that sense. And if someone had something that they didn't want to share, I think they were just sophisticated enough not to put it out there to the extent that they would have to keep it. So they gave up what they wanted to give up and kept close to the best with what they wanted to keep. The other is that they, um, they had these designers or artists who were perfectly, they went around the plane and they would do the drawing of your idea. So you would articulate as a group, you'd articulate your idea to the artist and then they would do the drawing. So if you go to ungroundedthinking.com, which is the website for the flight, you'll see the similar type of style of design to describe each project that came off the flight, and that was the designer. So that's how they shared it. So no one had a particular design that they would have patented. Or my, my group had a very interesting dynamic that the idea that we had, some of the executives on my team had technology already within their company that they offered up at no charge if we got selected. So Intuit had some technology, and there was this the guy with all the uh, translations of different languages. Right. And we, we thought that was a great advantage for our product because we thought, hey, we're leveraging resources that these guys have the capacity to give us at no charge. And it's great for them, it was, right? Yeah. I mean, that it was, the UN's going to use do a project that their technology is based on? So yeah, I mean, in that respect, I didn't get any sense of, you know, I think it was just, it was an amazing experience. And, Everybody, when I was leading up to it, my friends would be like, what are you doing? I go, I have no idea. I'm going to San Francisco. I'm assuming I'm coming back. That was my expectation. <laughs> well, we'll just leave it on that note then. Thank Apple profusely Thank for bringing you, us together and giving us this incredible opportunity to relive our flight. Um, which, as you can see, we're still talking about it, and it happened in the spring. And invite everyone here to join us upstairs um, to chat more and chat with the Apple folks. And the view is incredible. If you haven't ever been up there, I highly recommend it. And there's some great refreshments, so see you upstairs. Thank you.